Good morning, everyone. Can you hear? Um, well, thank you all for coming to listen to our students and their perspective. Um, the youth department at the Aspen Chapel partnered with an organization called World Leadership School, for which I also work. And I saw an opportunity in our valley where we see so many people coming to work to help make this place so beautiful and run so well. And I saw a connection with El Paso, which is, has three or four ports of entry. And it really is a bridge between two nations where um, people share culture and they share history. And it's actually one of the most dynamic and most loving cities I've ever been in. And so we, uh, we, I decided it would be really great to do a border immersion and to give students from a variety of backgrounds an opportunity to explore some of these very complex issues. And the idea isn't to make it political. The idea wasn't to inform them of a certain position or to get them to stand on one side or the other. The idea was to open their hearts and to, see, and to hear a lot of different perspectives because ultimately, I think the way we develop wisdom and the way that we come to decisions in our lives must come from wisdom. And the way that we establish that is through listening to our hearts, through listening to each other, really listening to each other, and by experiencing. And this program is designed to push people off balance and to put them in a very uncomfortable setting. It was not an easy trip. There was no downtime. There was no aspect of a vacation in this, in this program. It was um, uncomfortable physically. And you know, I've heard people say, well, why not do something here? Why not just do service here? The idea is to expose people to the temperatures in El Paso, the smell, the flavors, the people, holding people's hands, looking in their eyes, that's where we develop wisdom. And so that was my intention. And so today we have our students, and if you'd like to come up so everyone can see you, come take a chair. We have Carla Soto from Basalt High School. We have Carolina Robinson from Aspen High School. We have Nicole Pearson from CRMS. We have Gabriela Silva from Basalt High School, Fiona Ritchie from CRMS, and Tilly Swanson from Aspen High School. So as you can see, we have a variety of perspectives, a variety of backgrounds, and so everybody brought their own stories to our program. And um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that in this past couple of weeks, we've seen a tragedy unfold in El Paso. And I, I've been to El Paso four times. And my impression of that city is that it's dynamic, it's cosmopolitan, it's friendly, it's safe, it's loving. And I've never seen so many passionate people in one concentrated area working for good, working for justice. And so this thing that just unfolded really puts a a shadow over what El Paso really stands for. And I'd like to just take a moment to allow some of our students to share how that might have impacted them, the fact that they were there. The airport is right near that Walmart. They were in that setting. They, they knew, they met people, held hands with people. So I just want to know if you'd like to share, you don't have to, but if you'd like to share your perspective on how that landed on you. So is, would anyone like to, I'll just pass it along and if you have something to share, go ahead and um, I actually hadn't thought about this too much, but it is incredible that we were in the same place where there was a tragedy, but I feel like the way our country is right now, we're all connected to these tragedies, so I think it's not really a unique experience. We all have some connection to something like this. I think it's easy for a lot of people to remove themselves from things like this. And for all of us, because we were there so recently, because we made connections with people there, it just hit me that much harder because you think you know someone there. It could have been someone you know. Um, for me, it was more of, it was attack on people of my race. So it could have been me in that store at that moment. So that really terrifies me, but I just, I'm glad it wasn't in that situation, but my heart is with all the people there, and that just unifies us as a race and as 
just opens the eyes to the rest of the country of how it is and we have to make a change. Um, like Michelle said, El Paso is really loving and kind and it's not somewhere you'd think something like this would happen. Um, and so for me, that was mostly really shocking because everyone we met there was so kind and so welcoming. Uh, and it's just really shocking that even in a place like that, terrible things can unfold. Yeah, so for me, it was really kind of a grounding experience. Uh, like Fiona said, these things happen, but it's so easy to detach ourselves from them and kind of act as if it probably won't happen to us, but to actually have been there, to have been near the location where it happened, to know people who live there, it just made it feel so much more real and relevant in my life, personally. And then for me, being there so recently, it was very kind of eye-opening and um, because El Paso was such a um, heartwarming and open community to inviting us there and having us there. And for me, it was very just tragic seeing what had unfolded in such a giving community. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So hopefully we can set that aside and move forward as we've, know, as we've seen with the service that just occurred with the, the woman who was killed, but she didn't have any family, but then there was a huge outpouring of love and support. That is the El Paso that we saw. And so uh, we are going to begin with a poem that Fiona wrote, but before I do that, I would like to just acknowledge our flower arrangement done by Shelley Franklin. Where are you? <laughs> When we, when we came in this morning, it was just uh, these stark white, uh, I guess, pieces of driftwood and then these um, very straight black sticks that almost look like a border fence. And so the representation is that it's a very black, it seems to be a black and white issue. But within that very complex, <laughs> well, I think it's complex, this, compl this black and white issue is a colorful mix of stories. And that creates a situation that, yes, it could be black and white if it's just political, but once we add the human piece, it becomes very colorful and a little grayer as these flowers wilt. Um, but anyway, she made that, she designed that to honor our service today, so. Okay, Fiona. This is a poem that I wrote for the Aspen Times with a 400 word limit. And I wrote it about my reactions to our trip. And it's called 80 Words Left. Tens of millions of people flee millions of cities worldwide, escaping gangs, drug cartels, civil wars, human trafficking, abuse, religious persecution. The list goes on. Seeking opportunity, medical care, protection, freedom not to terrorize. Thousands of people crowd US border cities, but I only have 400 words to tell you the story of the people coming through the 328 ports of entry where only 30 asylum cases are reviewed each day. To tell you that in courtrooms where it takes less than 20 minutes to charge immigrants with illegal entry, 19 year olds get deported, and groups of 10 immigrants pleading guilty in the same case, that seven lawyers in the courtroom are outrageously outnumbered by the immigrants they represent, that the hopeful story of a Guatemalan family of six staying together is a rare case, that their four children were just excited to be outside, finally free to play soccer. To introduce you to the farm workers, who wake up at three in the morning to search for work, to share the two personal stories we heard, which made us shed tears, reminded us to appreciate and love our families. Because we are lucky, we are lucky to have our families together. Stories pleading we place people over profit, not vice versa, teaching us to ignore stereotypes, because although Argelia's husband wore an orange jumpsuit, he was not a criminal. He was a father, a lover, a neighbor, a worker, 
only trying to return home. And Carmen only wanted her family together, her daughter to live. But I am only one person, and I alone cannot help the tens of millions of, immig of immigrants. But I know there are 7.5 billion people on this earth, and among them must be enough people with an enough love in their hearts to help those immigrants. I hope I don't have to use the 80 words I have left to convince you to be one of those people. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce, I'd also like to introduce Nanette Weinhold. Can you come up, please? Nanette is the capstone teacher at Basalt High School. We knew each other from our old teaching days at the community schools, and she accompanied me on this trip. And I'd love for you to share also, uh, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll go to Tilly. Um, but this is our opportunity to share the perspectives that we took away from the experience. So. so when Michelle told me about this opportunity for students in the Valley, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And um, I brought it to the juniors last year as an opportunity for Capstone, which is a, um, it's an experience that students can have centered around anything that they're interested in. And immediately these two students came to me and they said, we want to go, we want to go. And I'm thinking, I want to go too. <laughs> and um, I just want to say it was an incredible experience, even for me as an adult, as a chaperone. Um, it's the ultimate way of learning about something, is to be immersed and to, like Michelle was saying, it's just a visceral sensory experience. Um, and that's learning. And honestly, I hope that someday every student can have this type of learning in their life because it's life changing. And, you know, even for me as an, as an adult, I just, these images, these stories, they're going to live with me forever and they've changed me. So I just want to thank Michelle for letting me come. <laughs> so thank you. So my name is Tilly Swanson. I'm going to be a junior at Aspen High School. And in early June, I went on the border immersion trip with my five fellow students and our two chaperones. Before I was going, I was nervous about the silliest things. I couldn't think of what I would wear that'd be modest for the trip. I just couldn't wrap my head around how I was going to do this, and I kept getting caught up in little details. But when we got there, it just struck you. Everything was very different. Everywhere we went, people were nice. They talked to you differently. Our first moment there, we got people to sing happy birthday to Fiona. It was just an incredible community, and I think we were all struck by this experience. So on our fifth day there, we went to the immigration courts. Now, there are two kinds of immigration court. There is the criminal court and there is the civil court. We went to criminal court. Now, the only crime committed by these 20 to 40 men was that they crossed between a port of entry. So there are gates in the border and then there are places where it is just a fence. This means they crossed over the fence. Doesn't seem like it'd be a big deal, but this is a misdemeanor where they are then put into jail. They are handcuffed and shackled. And they are put in orange jumpsuits to be marched in front of the court and plead guilty to be sent back to their home countries. Now if they try again through a port of entry, between ports of entry, legally, with papers, without papers, it is a felony. They can be sentenced to up to 25 years in jail, simply for trying again. Now, these men were, many of them were young, and they're marched up in front of us, shackled together, simply for having walked across a line. Now, in our court system, your lawyer is supposed to know everything about your story. They're supposed to know every little detail so that they can defend you to the best of their ability. But these lawyers hadn't met these men before trial. 
So five lawyers were marched up there with their 10 immigrants and told, well, they're gonna plead guilty. Try and get them the lowest sentence possible. The judge has seen so many of these cases and the lawyers have seen so many of these people that no one really considers it anymore. They're just like, yes, time served, deportation, please leave. That's it. There is no humanity in it. Our court system has been corrupted by this. This system is meant to give justice to those who were accused and provide relief to those who were attacked. And yet in this case, the accused and the attacked are the same. And we simply let them be returned to their country without any more thought. Now, we did not get to see civil immigration cases. As this is civil court, we could not see it. But we did talk to a lawyer who works these cases. So most people come claiming asylum, but almost all asylum cases are denied. So there are 334 immigration judges to do all of these cases. This means there are 2,000 people per judge, 2,000 people, 2,000 families, 2,000 children that these judges have to get through in a year. And they're only allowed to grant a few people to come in. So most of them get denied because it is almost impossible to prove persecution. To prove you have been persecuted, you have to have documents that say you called the police and the police did nothing. Or documents that say the gang attacked me because I wasn't white. That's a pretty hard thing to prove. And they don't listen to your stories. So these courts are a mockery of what our justice system should look like. And yet, we continue to let them happen. We continue to agree with these people who are destroying the system and manipulating it simply to send families back to the torture they're escaping. So in witnessing this, all you want to do is make a change. There aren't enough public defenders. There aren't enough judges. There just aren't enough. No matter what we do, there's still people who need our help. So anything you can do, and anyone else, I don't actually see anyone else our age, but become public defenders, become judges, do something to help. And I just wanna leave you with that, thank you. Um, I've grown up around immigrants my entire life. Growing up, I participated in the traditional Mexican folk dance, Baile Folklorico. But I had no idea that I was any different than the girls I participated with. I was the only gringa amongst all of them. And they have a tradition where for every performance, they wear these black braids that are made and you click them into your hair. But my sister and I were the only girls that didn't have black hair. So the women that ran the program were kind enough to make us blonde ones. And even though they did that, even though we looked different, we had no idea that we weren't part of that family, that we weren't the same. I had no idea until a few years later, my mom showed me a Shutterfly picture of a group when we performed on Cinco de Mayo. And I was the only little white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes in the whole group. And what's troubled me since realizing that is that even though I felt no different, we treat immigrants like they're completely different people than we are. And this trip, that has inspired me to research it more and ultimately to go on this trip. And what this trip taught me was that these people are not any different than us. If anything, they have so many things that they can teach us. So what I want to share with you today is the lessons that I learned from the families we spoke with. The first woman we spoke with was Garmin, which there were some pictures in the slideshow of. And she told us the story of her reasoning and coming here. She came over for her daughter to receive medical care. And she and her daughter were granted legal entry, but her family was not and ended up being deported, meaning that she was the only one here left coping with her daughter's medical needs. Even so, her daughter died at 26 four years ago, and it was heartbreaking to hear that. 
and to see Carmen's reaction. So the lessons that she left us with was to place people over profit, which was a line in my poem because it stuck with me so much. Because she found so constantly in this system that she couldn't pay for the medical aid that she needed. And because of that, these hospitals were placing the profit that they might lose over the life of her daughter. So she wants us to be able to find more meaning in life than just money, because there's so much more to it. And her daughter, even though she died at 26, found so much more meaning in the short life she lived. So that was a really powerful lesson that stuck with me. The second family we talked to, um, the mother was a woman named Argelia. And she told us the story of her family coming over the border with, I think she had three children, and her husband came as well. But her husband ended up overstaying his 72-hour visa and ultimately got deported. And she told us the story of his struggles in getting back. He tried to cross the border, I don't remember how many times, too many times, and got turned away every time. So the story that she left us with, the lessons she taught us, was not to stereotype immigrants, because not all immigrants are criminals. Her husband, when he was deported and denied entry, was painted as a criminal, put in an orange jumpsuit, sent through the criminal system, just like everybody else, when, like Tilly said, the only crime these people have committed is crossing a line that we've made up. And that's not fair for us to consider them as the same sort of people who are committing murders or sexual abuse. The second thing that she left us with is to appreciate your family. Because her family was broken up and torn to pieces. They didn't see each other for years. So it was powerful for us to hear that and to remember that we are so incredibly lucky that we had our families to return home to. That we have so many people here in this valley that support us. That we have so much love in our lives and that we're not reaching across an invisible line to try and find it. What was the weirdest thing for me was after our day in court, that was our last day, we returned home that day, and we saw people forced to return to homes that they'd fled. We saw people in shackles, being pushed out of doors, forced to cross this invisible line back to the gangs, the religious persecution, the abuse that they'd been escaping. They were scared to go home. And so for me, returning home that day was just, I don't know how to describe the experience, because I was excited to return home. I was excited to get back to my family. But just earlier that day, I'd watched people forced to return home. So I want to leave you with this idea that we should be incredibly grateful for the homes that we do have, and that we can return to them to our families, to a safe place, because not everyone has that luxury. Thank you. All right. So to be honest, before this trip, I didn't really have an impression um, about the issue, mostly because News today is so controversial, nothing is factual straight from the source. Um, and that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to go on this trip. Um, I wanted to be exposed to facts straight from the source so that I cr could create my own opinions um, based on this issue. Um, and also so that I could share these facts with people like you um, around our community. So one of the first activities we did um, was to meet with this man named Carlos, who is the founder of a farm workers union in El Paso. Um, he is very knowledgeable about the history of farming, sustainable farming practices, um, and the situation um, these farm workers are in. Currently, there are about 5,000 to 12,000 agricultural workers along the border each year. Um, and this fact is quite incredible because it shows us how important these farm workers are to our economy. They do work that no one would ever think of doing and it's super arduous and incredibly hard. Um, the typical work day for a farm worker begins at about 2 or 3 a.m. They go out into the streets and employers who are looking for um, an employee for that day will choose 
um, between these workers. It's super, super important to realize and remember that none of these workers have a consistent job, ever. They go out each day hoping they get a job, but some are denied and some are taken. Once the employer chooses a worker, they are um, taken mostly to chili farms um, to harvest chilies, which is a very popular work um, type for these farm workers. Um, and they are given buckets to fill with these chilies. Now you may think these buckets are like sandcastle buckets or buckets you might wash your car with, um, but these buckets are trash can size, about this high, um, that they have to fill. <coughs> now they are paid by the bucket. So for every one bucket these workers fill, they get 65 to 75 cents per bucket. The average or the minimum wage in El Paso is about $7.50 per hour, and one farmer would have to fill 100 buckets an hour in order to fill this minimum wage, which is almost impossible. Once these farm workers are finished at about 3 or 3 to 5 p.m., they go to the farm workers' union, and this is where Carlos comes in. Um, <coughs> He provides these workers with food, showers, hot water, cold water, clothes, and a place to sleep. And so these farmers come in, they use the resources that Carlos gives them, and they go right to bed at about nine because they have to get up at two or three every morning and do the same thing over again. Now, I, like I'm assuming most of us in this room, have or had a job. Um, and sometimes these jobs can be very annoying or frustrating, and sometimes you don't want to be there, sometimes you're in a bad mood, um, and I know I've had days like that. But seeing this firsthand um, and hearing about it has made me realize that my job is nowhere near as hard as these farm workers. And so I would like to remind you and encourage you that if you're having a hard day at work or <laughs> you just don't want to be there, that your job is so much easier than these farm workers and that you're super, super lucky to have a job that pays well, that is more fun and less arduous than these workers. Um, and so I'd like to leave you with that. Be grateful for what you have right now. Thank you. Um. I am Gabriela Magana Silva. I'm going to be a senior of assault. And um, this trip was really just a way for me to get my capstone done, but it was also really interesting to me because I am the daughter of immigrants, so it really caught my attention. Um, and while we were there, as you have heard, we have talked to two families, and both families had something that stuck with me. Um, but it was mostly just around the word family and how connected each family is because um, one, the daughter and the mother just showed me that your parent will do whatever it takes for you to be healthy, for you to be have a good life and just be living even though it costs them everything. And with the second family we met, it just made me realize that I am living out my parents' dream because they crossed the border that you have heard was so hard to cross and it was, it is, they are seen as criminals when they just want to give me a better life, when they want to give my brother a better life. Um, so to me, it just made me be really grateful for my parents because they have a really hard life. They have really hard jobs. They do not go to farms and pick chilies, but they clean houses. They make your lawn look really pretty. Um, and it is really hard for them because I see them get home really, really tired. And I get home from my job and I have the, the most energy because I work at a store with air conditioning and I just live the life while they are really not having that much luxury. But I am so grateful for them because thanks to them, I'm able to do work at that store, go to school and just live my life. So from what I got was, live out your parents' life because, and be grateful for them just because they might not always be there and they just realize that they give up so much for you. Hi, 
Hi, I am Carla Soto, and I am going to be speaking about Border Patrol and speaking with Border Patrol. So before the trip, it was kind of, I had seen um, information about Border Patrol, and it was very negative. It was very big um, negative attention towards them. But from speaking with them, I realized that they're really good people, and they're working as hard as they can to fulfill their job. Um, Border Patrol works with making well, pr patrolling the border, basically. And um, they take immigrants, and ICE um, handles their processings after that. And that's something I didn't know. So I thought Border Patrol was, you know, doing all the work, basically. Um, they're real people. They have kids. And um, from speaking with the two agents we spoke with, I realized that they connect a lot with what, you know, happens at the border because they have kids. And so seeing little kids suffer makes them suffer too. And um, I also learned that um, some of them have lots of um, anxiety and mental illnesses because of this. And so realizing that since they're also, because they are real people, they get mental health days. And so they get uh, 12 mental health days for the whole, you know, work year. And so realizing this is um, kind of frustrating because they do have one of the hardest jobs an agent could have. And understanding that they are severely understaffed and are having to do the job for so many other people makes me realize that we need to appreciate them too because they're working to keep us safe and to make sure, you know, everyone's safe here. And so, that's what I took away that, you know, even though there's such big negative attention towards Border Patrol, they really are good people. And just like there's good and bad police officers, there's good and bad Border Patrol with everything there is. So the lesson I took away from them was that there's good and bad people everywhere, and that's something we can't stop. So thank you. So... This trip, if I could describe it in a few words, for me would be life-changing. From listening to the stories of the farm workers to talking with Border Patrol, I learned and developed opinions that I never thought I would have. And one of the most inspiring things about this whole trip was talking to the people who spend their lives working to help immigrants and to improve them. We met with uh, Dr. Mendoza, who lives in the US, but every day she drives two to three hours across the border bridge to go to Mexico and provide healthcare for poor people in Mexico for almost no money. And keep in mind that if she didn't do this, these people would have no healthcare at all. They wouldn't have access to simple things like the dentist or doctor's checkups that we take for granted all the time. And she has the ability to go and make money as a doctor, but she chooses not to. She chooses to have her clinic and to help the working people who can't afford it otherwise. And then there was people who run bookstores and they collect donations of books and clothing. And then every day, once a week, they go to the various churches that are housing immigrants that are going through the, through the process of going to court or being housed and getting their visas and they bring clothes and they bring books in English and Spanish to keep these families, these people, these children learning and, in, and connected. And they help people learn English. They help kids who can't go to school because their family is being processed. They help them keep reading. They help them keep learning. And I just found all of these people that we talked to who spend their life helping immigrants and helping these families who would otherwise have no one there to help them. And I just found that the most inspiring thing. And that was a huge takeaway listening to these people. It inspired me to want to do something like that in my community, to want to share this experience and to want to do something similar, whether it's donating clothing or helping people learn English, it made me want to be a better person. And I think that's something that we can all take away, whether or not we've had this one-on-one -on -one experience, but just listening to it, 
I think we can all learn a little more and help to better our community. And um, just invite the uh, participants, if you'd like, to sit down for a moment. Um, and um, Barbara's going to sing to us. Um, this is a poem titled Running to America by Luis Rodriguez. They are night shadows violating borders, fingers curled through chain link fences, hiding from infrared eyes, dodging 30-30 bullets. They leave familiar smells, warmth, and sounds as ancient as the trampled stones running to America. <coughs> There's a woman in her finest border crossing wear, a purple blouse from an older sister, a pair of worn shoes from a church bazaar, a tattered coat from a former lover. There's a child dressed in black, fear sparkling from dark Indian eyes, clinging to a headless Barbie doll. And the men, some hardened, quiet, others young and loud, you see something like this in prisons. Soon they will cross on their bellies, kissing black earth. They run to America. Strange voices whisper behind garbage cans, beneath freeway passes, next to broken bottles, the spatter of words, textured and multicolored, invoke demons. They must run to America. Their skin, color of earth, is a brand for all the great ranchers for the killing floors on Soto Street and as slaughter for the garment row. Still they come, a hungry people have no country. Their tears are the grease of the bobbing machines that rip into cloth that make clothes that keep you warm. They have endured the sun stranglehold, El Cortito, foundry heats and dark caves of mines swallowing men. Still they come, wandering bravely, through the thickness of this stream's land, maddening ambivalence. Their cries are singed with fires of hope. Their babies are born with a line in their hearts. Who can confine them? Who can tell them which lines never to cross? For the green rivers, for their looted gold, escaping the blood of a land that threatens to brown them, they have come, running to America. What an amazing stories you've come to tell us, and I'm so grateful. Um, we have, this is the moment of our prayers. You know, what is the point of prayer? Prayer is really to change not what's out there, but to change ourselves so that we can be more appropriate to what's out there. And you've really given us an opportunity to change ourselves through your stories. So let's just take a moment. We just pray for these young people who've uh, been out and we thank you for them, for what they brought us back here. We pray for the town of El Paso, touched by tragedy, all those who are suffering at the moment from whatever circumstances in that town. We give thanks for the vibrancy and joy and beauty of the people who live and work and are of El Paso. We offer our prayers for the world that we may be appropriate to the circumstances that we find, that we may bring wisdom and love and justice where there is no wisdom, love, or justice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>